So, energy. We use a lot of it. As I'm sure the kind of person who would be watching this video is already well aware of. And, no matter how intensely so many may apply their best efforts to prevent, we are only going to be using more and more and more as the future goes on, and for a wide variety of reasons. We'll go through at least eight of these main factors, the first of which I'm so sure nobody saw coming at all, which is our increasing human population. Yes, as much as it may be undesired, the population of the world is still increasing. We are somewhere right over 7.7 .7 billion right now, and still well on our way up. Likely going for 8 billion by 2023 or 2024, 9 billion sometime in the 2030s, and about 10 billion right around 2050 or so. People, even at their lowest possible level of usage, all use energy. So, some very basic logic will allow you to conclude more people means more energy is going to be used. And, for some more than others, as quite a few countries who are already at first world living standards still have rising populations, like the US, Australia, the UK, France, Singapore, South Korea. Granted, some of them aren't rising all that fast anymore, but they're still climbing up nonetheless. More people need more things. More things take more energy to make. More food takes more energy to harvest and transport. More buildings take more energy to construct. And then everything, people included, takes more energy to move around. And of course, more people will use more energy directly themselves, using more devices, lights, appliances, heating, cooling, everything. Now, the second factor on a similar tie-in note is rising economies, or rising nations, whichever term you prefer to use. Or more rather, the swiftly rising number of people living at first world living standards. And there are billions of people who either still have yet to rise, or are only partially done rising. For just a few examples, Pakistan is economically rising really fast, and that's 200 million people right there coming up into higher living standards. Over in Africa, Nigeria is rising up pretty fast. That's another 200 million people right there. India is obviously one of the big ones, although uh, they're already mid or halfway through the process. They still have at least another half billion people among their population to continue raising up, though. China's mostly risen already now, though they still have a couple hundred million people to finish bringing up all the way. Indonesia is uh, economically rising decently fast, and they're heading towards a population of 300 million. So basically, even with just the current global population, there's still another four to five billion people yet to rise into first world living standards. And as they do, energy use is only going to go in one direction. Okay, so factor three climate change. So for the very, very few people who may have been unaware, temperature extremes have been growing more and more common, and more and more extreme. With brutal heat lingering over entire summers now, and past the end of summers, and arriving well before the start of summers, plus now spontaneous extreme blasts of cold in winter for many places, at least by most people's standards. Those of us who live up here in the Arctic kind of just uh, sit and laugh at the utter hysteria that breaks out anytime something even resembling actual cold uh, starts moving down south. But regardless, more frequent extreme temperatures of greater extremes only causes greater increases in energy consumption because we have to temperature correct cooling or heating the inside of our homes and all our other buildings to, you know, provide safe zones from heat stroke or hypothermia, depending on which extreme you're dealing with. Heating, of course, takes energy because you have to put energy into the system. You have to insert energy into the air via your heating mechanism in order to heat the air up. 
cooling also obviously uses energy because you have to put energy into the mechanism that removes the heat from the air inside of the area you desire to cool. So that's all going to keep going. Fourth now we move on to is the inevitable and necessary rise of indoor or non-traditional farming. Due to a wide number of things, loss of farmland to everything from soil loss, erosion, sea level rise, desertification, urban and suburban development, and much more. Plus also the sort of maxing out of our usage of our available farmland already. There's different models uh, for different uh, setups of this, but all in all the basics remain the same across most of them. In an artificial farming setup, it's extremely energy intensive because you either have to completely or at least partially replace nature and all of the energy intensive processes that nature would normally do for us. You now have to provide intense lighting to allow the plants to conduct photosynthesis, pump water to and from and around the plants, both to water them and to cycle nutrients through at an optimum rate for them to grow, monitor and circulate or adjust the air inside the farming building, and of course, uh, cooling or heating the building to keep it at the best optimal growing temperature for the crops that you're intending to grow inside. That's just a few aspects of it, all of which require the usage of energy. Okay, so number five, still related to food production actually, is waste nutrient recovery. So those of you who are frequent viewers and or subscribers, if you're not, then please subscribe and hit the bell. I would really appreciate it. And like this video, of course, if you enjoy things of the sort. But those of you who are frequent viewers have heard me say well and enough before that we're going to eventually be running into some supply issues with phosphate rock the mineral resource from which we get our wondrous phosphorus fertilizer and nutrient for our crops all over the world. The miracle mineral that allows us to grow so many crops so quickly and so efficiently. So many have proposed the idea of setting up nutrient recovery systems to recover phosphorus and other key nutrient elements from waste, aka sewage. This would be on top of the sewage treatment systems that we already have and use that uh, are just to collect and detoxify our sewage, we'd be adding on, or rather will be adding on inevitably, these additional systems which will use more energy to specifically recover uh, phosphorus and other plant nutrients out of the sewage on top of then the sewage, you know, being treated in the regular treatment plant. And also, after that, we'd be spending more energy to then transport around the recovered nutrients. Now for number six, we head slightly over to water, or getting water. With many, many places, from cities to entire countries, either running out of fresh water or simply growing beyond the area's natural uh, replenishment rate of its water systems. This, of course, presents a problem since... Water is kind of a necessity. So different solutions of different sorts obviously have been proposed and are being implemented. One of the most common of which, at least uh, for countries with a coast, is desalination plants, which intake enormous amounts of ocean water and remove the salt and other minerals and turn it into fresh water. A process that anyone familiar with desalination plants knows requires an exorbitant amount of energy. Like typically, a desalination plant can on its own consume half the energy output of an average power plant nearby it. Which is why, you may see in some of the images, desalination plants are built in tandem with an entire new power plant just to power them. Other means of uh, being pumping diverted water from an alternative far away source, which also takes a lot of energy because water is kind of heavy. So forcing it to go in a different direction than the one it was already inclined to go in kind of requires a massive energy input. Now with only two more left, number seven is carbon capture. Many nations are very quickly putting carbon emission reduction at the top of their priority lists. 
and are also just as quickly realizing both that carbon zero isn't actually the feasible goal it was first being sold as, and that even if somehow uh, we did eliminate all human emissions on Earth, there's still all that excess CO2 already up there in the atmosphere that we already deposited into it that's going to continue causing further warming with or without us. So the idea of carbon removal from the atmosphere is beginning to spread. And there's all kinds of different ways and mechanisms. There's different models being tested, different pilot plants being set up. Not just planting trees, mind you, which do remove a lot of carbon, but they don't exactly do it quickly. So that's where, of course, all kinds of decarbonizing machines are going to inevitably come in. The two different primary uh, pilot plants that I'm aware of at the moment are one in Switzerland and one in Canada. The one in Canada I'm a bit more familiar with. It's a large air intake machine and it consumes less power than I actually expected it to. It only needs a power supply of about 12 kilowatts and removes about a ton of CO2 per day. However, uh, you would need a lot of these things even just to counter, you know, our active emissions each year, let alone start sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and reducing the concentration. So when we inevitably start building stations of these things in mass numbers, it's only going to increase our energy usage. And number eight is the onward expansion of the digital age. As more and more of the world's population comes online, literally, not just the oil and gas term, as more and more new websites and platforms are created, as more, more and more data is constantly uh, being created, uploaded, sent digitally, stored digitally, ever-expanding numbers of server banks, data centers, network processing centers, cloud data storage units, and all of it. More will be built, and those things aren't short on energy consumption either. Just to wrap things up with one ridiculous example, some of you may have actually seen the article when it was published, but as of recently, all the computers and servers being used around the world just to deal with Bitcoin are now combined consuming more electricity than the entire country of Ireland. And that's just one. That's just one of the uh, numerous ridiculous roads you can go down or examples you can pull up. You can think of plenty of other nonsensical things, I'm sure, like uh, how much energy is being consumed and wasted by all of the world's stupid Fortnite servers. But then again, what is or isn't worthwhile isn't for any one person to decide. Now that's just eight, but eight of the biggest and pretty crucial reasons why humanity's energy consumption is only going to increase, just like my living costs. With which, if you'd like to help me out, please use my PayPal insert below. Anyone who gives anything will get their name carved into a giant chunk of coal, but I'm really going to be needing the help now more than ever. Otherwise, please like the video if you enjoyed, and subscribe and bell click as well, because there's always more stuff to come. Good night, I'll see you all around next time.